My name is Ann Harris. I'm not all, uh, ever sure about how to uh, describe me anymore. I'm, uh, I live in Tennessee. Uh, I work for the Tennessee Valley Authority for uh, 16 years. During those 16 years, uh, it was not quite, it's just like two or three months shy of 16 years. During those 16 years, I uh, prevailed in six whistleblower cases against them five of them while I still was on the payroll. I had come back to move back to Tennessee to the ancestral home and uh, was uh, was living there and I needed a job. This was uh, the end of the uh, 70s and into the 80s under the Reagan administration and I needed a job. I needed one that would pay and where I could make a, a, a decent salary, have some retirement funds and some uh, insurance, some benefits. And so I uh, acquired uh, a job as a clerk, as a document a clerk in the uh, instrumentation engineering uh, portion of the construction site at Wattsmar Nuclear Plant in not, January 1982. And uh, from there, uh, I began to, uh, they told me I'd be there like nine months at the very most. I ended up uh, on that same job site for 14 years without moving. Um, I went from being a clerk in instrumentation to uh, uh, a clerk uh, doing uh, engineering aid work, filed uh, EEO complaints prevailed in those. It was uh, a big metal two-story building that in the summertime uh, the downstairs was uh, uh, air-conditioned and cool. Upstairs was air-conditioned and cool but it was always dirty and muddy and uh, because uh, it was a construction site. Uh, TVA was uh, building their the, the last uh, nuclear unit that they would take online. In 1984 all their other uh, they canceled like 17 units in one, just one swipe, with it, like you'd swipe a credit card one afternoon. And they decided they couldn't afford them. Uh, they didn't need them. God knows they didn't need them. They still don't need them. Um, but uh, somebody had come in and started practice, had them practicing efficiency and uh, was uh, producing um, a way of life for the valley, which, which TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, is a quasi-government corporation. Mm -hmm. It runs in on this premise, kind of like the uh, post office. They're not government owned, but they're government agency as such. They're under that umbrella. And TVA happened to be um, where I lived, uh, took care of the rivers and the dams, the hydros, uh, and the coal-fired steam plants. Our family had a long history uh, with dealing and working with TVA in various places. Uh, my mother had worked at Oak Ridge during World War II. She was uh, uh, radiated there. Uh, she just died recently. Uh, just buried her in the past couple of months. Well, they fired her because she didn't show back up for work. She was over at the hospital under an oxygen tent. <laughs> I mean, this is what Stone and Webster did for her. And uh, they uh, denied that anything happened to her. 50, 51 years later, after many um, uh, cancerous uh, uh, on her body, and she died of colon cancer, um, after many of those trials and tribulations, uh, 51 years it took me to get her paperwork to show uh, that she had been uh, radiated, uh, almost intentionally, because there was an accident one of those unplanned events that the re industry refers to. It was an unplanned <laughs> event. Um, it, it was an accident where the, the, the ovens where they were cooking, the yellow cake blew up and she was covered in the hot yellow dust and she breathed it in and her lungs turned into water and it coated her lungs and she, uh, she had problems with her lungs and uh, uh, emphysema and breathing problems throughout the rest of her life. And many, uh, one, at one point, uh, a portion of her face was, uh, had to be uh, taken away. They had to reconstruct it because she developed uh, tumors uh, in the side of her face and around her eye. Um, but uh, she was a gorgeous woman. And uh, then she had to have them taken off of her nose and around her face and eyes. Cancerous tumors now. Not 
not something that you see on you and I that uh, is uh, like maybe a, just a mole or a, a, sun, a sunspot, something like that. These were, these were the deadly kind. So she survived that. She was uh, uh, 88 years old almost. She was like three months shy of her 88th birthday when she died. And uh, strong, uh, strong-willed, uh, raised a family of four. My father was in the Navy. And we were uh, a country, uh, we were a farming family. Uh, we had, we owned a huge dairy farm. Uh, we were just country people. And I uh, up and left, and then I came back. I worked in the textile industry for 23 years. And I came back to, uh, and I needed a job. Mother said, go to TVA. So I said, where do I go? She said, go down to the nuclear plant, apply down there. So I I, I, did, I wasn't sure what nuclear power uh, was. I was a high school graduate. I, uh, I was nervous. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, my husband, uh, he had always worked construction since oh, we'd been married with our children. And um, I knew that he came home, you know, wearing heavy boots and uh, blue jeans and you know he was he was a working man he was a welder and uh, he he uh, he said you may not like this and I said why and he said well it can be awfully dirty and he said women are not always treated very good by some of the people I said oh I said I'll be okay so I went to uh, I got a job and went to work in January 1982 it was uh, it was in the summertime even in the wintertime even the dust, that fine sand dust, you know, like in dust storms, it was always on that job site. Grass was not an issue um, because everything was swiped clean down to the dirt and, and rock where the driveways were. You, if it was raining, you waded mud. Uh, everybody had to wear, uh, at the very least, ankle boots above your ankles. Um, I wore blue jeans to work every day, uh, flannel shirts, uh, big old denim shirts, t-shirts underneath them and f denim shirts over the top of them because the last thing you wanted anybody to know was unless they knew that you was a female, you kept your head down and kept your mouth shut. Uh, hard hats with your name on them, uh, white hats was management, uh, the colored hats, it was different color for every, uh, all the different uh, uh, crafts. It was union job. Um, the union kept things, in, in, they kept it clean, if that makes sense. Um, there, was, there was bad things went on, but as a whole, um, it was good work. Uh, I was paid uh, $9,000 a year, which was a lot of money to me back in the early 80s for a 42-year-old woman. And, I mean, I'd made a lot more on a previous job, but I, I could live with what I was making. They said I'd be there nine months. <laughs> that uh, it was nine years later, whenever I got the first paycheck, that I did not have overtime on. Nine years, I worked six, seven days a week, sometimes as much as 14 hours, 16 hours a day. There was always, there's, there's this abundance of paper that is part of the the makeup of a nuclear facility because everything has to be traced from cradle to grave and you have to be able to know what uranium mine it came up what train did it ride on who um, who cooked it down who made the fuel rods where were they inserted where was the, the reactor itself? Where was it made? Where did the steel, where was the iron ore from? Was it the, 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 the quality control was astounding to me because I'd come out of the textile industry where I took my hand to feel if a carpet was right. My eye told me if the color was right. You know, th those kinds of things. But I was also astonished to see an almost corrupt attitude about certain issues. If they, if things were not um, always handled as the rules, 
And over time, as I began to know more and more of what was going on, I began to uh, have this feeling that something there's some things that just were not being done quite right. And I began to watch, and I kept my mouth shut. And I went to my uh, one of my supervisors one day, and I said, th th "Let me let me tell you this this, this work that they're telling us has been done." He's, I told him, I said. This this not has not been performed. That component does not even exist. He said, "How do you know?" And I said, "Well, one of the guys came back from the hole and told me that he can't find it." And then I sent another one. Then I sent a craft. I've sent four people down there, and none of them can find where this di where, where this component is supposed to be at. He said, "That can't be true." I said, "Yeah, but I went to the vault where we kept all of our documents. We didn't have computers." We couldn't scan things. We just had co we could do computer printouts. And he said, go, bring me a copy of what's in the vault. So I go to the vault. I check out the document, get it copied, bring it back to him. I said, here it is. And I said, this gentleman here, I said, he put on there and he affirmed, which is a legal term for I do solemnly swear, that this document is true. And this work has been done. And I said, he signed it and dated it and it's been given to the NRC. I said, that's, you told me that's a criminal offense. He said, it is. He said, that can't be true. And I said, okay. I said, but that work's not been done. It doesn't exist. It's never been there. That was the beginning of uh, my trials and tribulations. Um, I saw a lot of workers hurt that uh, were not given proper medical treatment. I saw workers hurt that were um, put on stretchers, carried to the emergency rooms, and to keep from having a lost time accident, they would put them back on a stretcher, carry them to their house. If they kept them, they would not take them to the hospital until they'd been after until they had a full four hours day out of them so they could count them as a full work day and then they would take them to the emergency room and then they would hold them there and then the next morning they would have them to take leave without pay and then two days later they would go and an ambulance would bring them back to the job site and they had a trailer where they would put them on a stretcher up in a trailer and keep them there so that these people would not show as being a lost time accident. This is common practice. It just happened at Brown's Ferry nuclear plant in Alabama, which TVA owns. Uh, that's the Fukushima plant, Fukushima Daiichi, the plant that is exactly like uh, what is in, in Japan. It was built by the same people, designed by the same people, and it was being run by the same people. It's all the same outfit that done that. And it's sitting down there with three units. And there was a man severely hurt. To keep it from showing a, a, a lost time accident, they took the um, they took the man, took him to the uh, emergency room. The head of nuclear power came to Alabama from uh, Chattanooga, wherever he lives around there, close by. Went down there, picked him up, brought him to Chattanooga, and took, brought the paperwork and transferred him back and backdated it to the day that the man was not showing he wasn't even on the job site. Brought him back to Chattanooga and put him in the hospital and had him treated and then uh, transferred him by a stroke of the pen. This is the way we do things in the nuclear industry. And then along comes somebody like me who says, that's not right, that's not the way we, this is not the American way of taking care of its workers. So over the years I raised uh, um, a lot of safety issues. I, w I became, after I won, well, I don't like to use the word won because I don't think I won anything. I kept my job, but I Did prevailed. You you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was breathing, but the thing was, I stayed on the payroll for the next, uh, the first, um, first action that I filed in, uh, 
uh, with the Department of Labor over safety was in 19... Uh, 85 I believe I can't remember exactly I just have to go back but that's close enough it was the mid 80s let me say it that way and um, I prevailed in that case and so and I they said now what do you want to do when you leave and I said what do you mean leave and they said you don't want to stay here do you and I said where, where do you want me to go to Wendy's over on the interstate and they said well we didn't think you'd want to stay here I said, I'm not leaving. I haven't done anything wrong. I went by every one of your rules. Now, over the years, don't misunderstand, I was run off the road on my way home from work late one night. My car was uh, tampered with on the job site on two separate occasions. Once the dr they tried to drop the drive shaft out of it, it was parked within a less than 50 feet of the guard shack. They were supposed to be watching it, but apparently when all this was going on in daylight hours, they were having difficulties with their backs because they were apparently reading the posters on the wall in the guard shack. And uh, then another time they wired it for it to be firebombed. It just did not go off as I opened the door. Just did not go off. Um, there was all kinds of... The, uh, I, my telephone on my desk uh, was, uh, it was, they listened in on to it. Sometimes the people was eavesdropping. I mean, it was kind of funny. Uh, I would, uh, we'd talk, I'd talk to them. I'd say, guys, please hush so I, we can both hear. I mean, it, it was all kinds of harassment on just a regular basis. I mean, it was just, it was childish. It was eight-year-old type stuff you know eight-year-old little boys you know they'll do all kinds of put frogs in their pockets they want to stick a dip a, a rubber snake up in your face it was this is kind of that kind of mentality was what I was dealing with daughter was threatened on her job site they went into the where she was working and said your mom needs to uh, shut her mouth or we're going to shut you and her uh, she came home terrorized in tears uh, I think the message went out uh, that you don't you don't mess with our family, uh, and you do not. You may harass me, but you will not intimidate me. Now, the difference between intimidation and harassment is, and if we, let's say it here clearly so that people will know what we're talking about. Intimidation is some sort of action to force you to deviate from the way that you were going. So if you're going to the, uh, uh, it, it, we, we refer to it as detours, uh, that causes emotional distress. And so if they can get you to change what you're doing or what you're saying or what you're thinking or who you're associating with, that's intimidation. They could never force me to change my, my straight line. Now they, don't misunderstand, they would harass me unbelievably, but I felt like that when they harassed me, I'd just file an action against them with the Department of Labor. Over the years, I prevailed in six cases against them, and over safety, and five EEO complaints for disparate pay. Uh, I was doing uh, high, much higher level work, uh, and I wasn't getting paid for it. They gave me back pay. My greatest accomplishment in all of the settlements <laughs> over the years was that in 1990, in November of 1990, we agreed to a financial settlement and with some other things to happen. But as a result of that, uh, they agreed and I agreed for me to go to college on their, on their checking account. Um, they gave me four years and eight months, which would be through the summer uh, semesters of college uh, to complete any degrees. And I had those four years and eight months to complete the degrees. I still received my salary. I was making um, $60,000 a year. Uh, they paid all my expenses, mileage, everything except food. They gave me a $10,000 credit card to pay my tuition to buy books. I never, not once, 
did they ever, ever find any discrepancies in my receipts? Because I always turned them in. I did my work and I did it correctly. I didn't try to cheat. I didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't abuse it in any way. Uh, my undergrad uh, was in a Bachelor of Science in Education uh, with uh, majors in Industrial Training. So I'm a certified trainer. Uh, I'm certified as a, a nuclear construction uh, document expert. Uh, I can testify as to what, about documents. Um, I also, uh, during that time, I got, th I got my undergrad in two and a half years. Uh, well, it's, let me put it this way, it's less than three years. I graduated with honors. Uh, I was on the dean's list. I didn't know what the dean's list was the first semester in school. I was just so so dumb. I was 51 years old when I started college. Um, I, uh, I, I ran two master's degree, two master's of sciences. I got a master of science, ran them parallel, uh, one in uh, gerontology and one in leadership studies and it, uh, adult education. And I am very proud of that. I really am. That's something they can't take away from. They might take away monetary uh, funds, or they may take away uh, my car. They may take away my job. They may take away a lot of things, but they cannot take away my college education. And I, I really, really am proud of that. In uh, uh, 1995, I went back on the job site. My job every day for those four and a half years was to go to work or go back and forth to college. I started out in junior college, uh, went uh, on, I started going to uh, uh, classes at the junior college in daytime and went to UT, the University of Tennessee in Knoxville at night. That went on for a year and a half. Uh, and in the meantime, I was dealing with other people that had safety issues and had EEO safety issues, had health issues. Uh, a lot of the problems that comes out of uh, nuclear plants is emotional distress. I mean, we're talking about uh, um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, the soldiers coming home from war. That sort of mentality is you deal with in the... In the uh, the nuclear industry, because everything is um, everything is frightening. This this is a very unforgiving industry. Um, it's it's really a really uh, ugly way to boil water, and it's got all these um, buttons and and whistles and. Uh, uh, the, the control room looks like something that uh, Dr. No would would find, you know. I mean, Dr. No and Edward Teller was, you know, that's who that's who that movie was. Most people don't think about that, but I think about it after I read the book, and then I go, Gee, God, I know where that movie came from, and everybody admits to it. It's kind of not hid well. The control room is. Uh, it looks like uh, think in terms of a dashboard of your car multiplied by like a thousand with all these little lights and they're all different colors and something's going off and coming on and you got alarms going off all the time. There's alarm going off. And then the other thing is that what I find wrong in the industry is that now they become so used to some of these alarms they don't even pay attention to them. That's where we get the scrams where the, you know it comes to you know it just shuts itself down. Um, and the, the, I mean, the core is still bubbling, you know, it's, it's still producing and the, the plant has shut itself down. That was one of the things that I uh, discussed today in our meeting uh, that I felt was real important. You can't just push a button and shut them down between now and daylight. That's not the way you, you're just you're just asking for trouble. Especially whenever they've been up to 100% power. You just don't do that. You got to bring them down slowly. There's, you know, and a lot of people when they say shut them down, they want to, you know, they want to push a button. It's like turn, let's turn off the key like you do on the car. Just put it in park and let's go. You can't do it that way. The rules and regulations say that you have to have plans, have to know what you're going to do with the waste, you know, all those kind of things. They're doing the same thing at every site in America. Every nuclear site in America is a waste dump. It's a garbage dump for nuclear fuel rods.
they have these uh, what they call spent fuel pools it's used they're still they cannot even move them they, once they put them over into that water you can't move them for like five say five years because they're so hot you can't put them and transport them anywhere because nobody wants them and the nuclear facilities in America today do not have any place to dump offload that and the fuel pools are full so now Yucca Mountain issue has become a deadly issue and they're sitting and a lot of them are leaking out into the local water systems and they'll say oh no we got them in these concrete casts well we already know from Chernobyl that the concrete does not encase uh, I dealt with a whistleblower uh, we call them we call ourselves safety advocates because safety is our primary purpose and I dealt with uh, Oscar Sharani up in uh, Chicago Oscar says that the uh, and he had the, the proof that the uh, uh, cast would not uh, they won't work they won't contain those rods the NRC does only keeps oversight of these fuel rods for about 20 years after they're taken off but they're still dangerous though they're, they're still well dangerous. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so who's in charge of, of oversight of them you and i it's me and you babe <laughs> it's just me and you babe it's <laughs> you, you, <laughs> for some reason or other people go oh that can't be oh yes that is now they've come up with this scheme that they want to reprocess those fuel rods and put them back in the plant but the problem here there's some minor details that's happening that people are not really aware of but i work with another nuclear group where the the, the health issues with these people are just it, it would make it breaks my heart every time i go see them what, what is the health issues with these workers uh, breast cancer, esophageal cancer, uh, brain tumors, uh, leukemia, um, kidney, liver, uh, skin, um, bone. Just pick you out something. This this is at a weapons facility uh, there in Upper East Tennessee. That it's it's hid up there in the mountains. Those mountain people they thought that they were just you know boy there sure are a lot of us sick yeah so somebody said you need to talk to this woman so I've been helping and working with them mm -hmm. I I've, I've, I'll work with anybody that's being abused my daughter in 1996 was brutally murdered in the midst of the startup of Watts bar her estranged husband brutally murdered her he tortured her uh, kept her uh, death a secret for like about 18 hours we couldn't locate her you can't startle me anymore I've seen w workers that I've worked with and helped them and their families and helped them for years and the m emotional distress uh, one of the men the, he was virtually hounded to death he died two months after his uh, retirement 56 years old another one was talking to his wife she was in Houston he was back in uh, Tennessee he was sitting in his recliner talking to her on the telephone the telephone dropped when the neighbor went to see about him he was dead the the, the trauma of doing what is right and then being persecuted for it is is a, a betrayal by corporations of the human spirit it is just unconscionable what these people do and it's all about the money and it's all about the power and I'm not talking about the electricity I'm talking about the human power want the power they have over other people and people's futures their homes their mortgages their kids their colleges their car payments that's the kind of power and they use that without a conscience it's just unconscionable how this industry treats its workers we have craft unions 
The other unions is a kind of a sort of a, a country club type union. Uh, it's Engineering Association, the EA, mm -hmm. uh, is what TVA has. And then there's the uh, OPEIU. Try when when they took me away from being uh, a um, clerk, mm -hmm. I went in. They put me into management because mm -hmm. I could get things done. Um, they seen that. Uh, and the man that promoted me, he said I had every right to complain because of the atmosphere I was working in. <laughs> and they, they, about, they about beheaded him for what he had said in a letter, put it in writing. The craft unions were the strongest. The strongest of all the unions in these circumstances is uh, the uh, IBEW. They have the upper hand because the industry can't afford for them to go on strike and not come have blue or blue days or sick days or blue flu or uh, red flu or whatever it is because the, these, uh, this industry would not run without the electricians. I mean it is electrical. I was a manager in electrical for uh, uh, before I went to college. Um, I was supervising uh, degreed engineers um, and I know I, I can read uh, the drawings uh, I would go down in the plant. I knew what was right and what was wrong. Uh, I was, uh, is a fast learner okay to use? <laughs> and I, and I, I didn't have any of this uh, airhead attitude. I was an older woman. Uh, I was a grandmother. Um, I was not, uh, I'm, in fact, I'm now a great-grandmother three times. Right. Um, it's um, the unions would come to me. I became like uh, they referred to me as a lightning rod. They came to me to find out what they could do about well, John Doe. This is what he done to me, and he's telling me that I'm out of here because I did not do what he said. And I said, Well, where's the rule that says that you, that's the way you're supposed to do it? And he would point me to it. I say, You go back and tell John that you've talked with me and that we're not having this out of him. He needs to get his self, he needs to get his house in line mm -hmm. because you, I, you know my telephone number. Manager, vice presidents have come to my house and I don't advertise. I don't advertise. I didn't, I didn't seek them out. They found me because of my activities. I kind of work underground. I still do. I retired from TVA in 1997. In 1998 I signed the last agreement with them. That was the last one and I'm, I, uh, I'm on their retirement. Uh, I, re I receive a retirement check every month from them. The issue is, is what I had to, my shtick I dealt with the issues, and if, if it was about safety, if it was about health, that was where I, that was my issue. I mean, I, why would I want to be publicized? It, when I went to work for TVA, they had 52,000 employees. TVA wouldn't even say my name out loud. They re always referred to me as that woman. They still do, and that's okay. You cannot go into any nuclear plant in America um, that has as constructed drawings that matches what's in the plant. And the first thing whenever there's a problem, they run to the drawings and they say, go run and see if that's what's really out there. Because remember I just told you about the guy that signed off and said it's in place, it's been fixed, it's been inspected. It hadn't even been, it wasn't even there. They brought in, uh, in the early days, because they were so desperate for employees, uh, for inspectors, for QA inspectors, that they went out to the local uh, Kroger stores and hired bag boys. Brought them, put them on the job site. They had to be able to, to do a visual sighting of what they were seeing, match what the label was on it with what the drawing said. And then they went in and signed off. Now they didn't know if it was put in the proper place. They didn't know if it was the, the, what was supposed to be there. They knew nothing except the paperwork said. 
uh, paperwork is what gets them every time. You'll see my office in this uh, video. <laughs> it, it really is, um, it looks like a bomb went off. I mean, these papers to the ceiling, there's boxes. It's just, it's, it's a working office. I know where everything is. They always leave their documents with me. <laughs> I just, it's like even the lawyers leave stuff. Uh, when the lawyers come in and, you know, try their cases or, or they have to, they're put it, they're taking depositions or whatever, they just say, we'll get these back. Or I'll tell you when to send them to me. Let me, let me leave them here so I'll have them here. Well, sometimes these things settle. Well, I'll, I'll take uh, their clients. We'll go to uh, Washington, D.C. They have a set. The client has a set. The lawyer has a set in D.C. I have a set in my house. Mm -hmm. And I always, get, excuse, I always get left with a set. You cannot find an issue about health care in this industry. You cannot find, you cannot find anything about it. It's, it's, uh, talking about security guards die, that are exposed on a daily basis to, uh, into the hot area, into the contaminated Aren't area. There's supposed to be records of people who are in nuclear facilities. And, there is. And they're radiated, and if they radiate too much, then they, they and there's, who, who enforces that in these, in these nuclear plants? The Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And who is, what do they do? Nothing. But they have a big staff. They have millions of dollars to regulate the industry. So? You expect them to work also? This is not my opinion. This is public record. In 1994, Senator Pete Domenici from New Mexico told the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that if you guys don't leave this industry alone, quit writing violations, quit putting these fines on these people, I'm going to cut your budget by 70%. Guess what? These guys will tell you in public. Yeah, he told us that and we believed him. Now, that old fool, he's still trying to find out what hospital he's going to die in. He's now started him up a little uh, think tank in D.C. to promote more nukes. Because he gets a lot of money out of the industry. God knows they love him. Him and the lobbyists, they call them themselves nuclear... Uh, Energy Institute, NEI, they even write, they don't even, they, they're so shameless, they, they don't even take their names off of the, the policies and procedures they write for these nuclear programs. They just put them in there, slap them on, and leave their name on them. Oh yeah, I can show you that on a regular basis. That's, that's, that's just, it's, it's done that way. I'm telling you, these people have no shame. Their lust for money is so great. And their greed for power. And there's a difference here. Lusting after money is one thing. But greed for power, to have some sort of control over another human being, it just no, it has no limits to it. It's boundless. They love terrorizing these people? And oh, sure they do. Some of the most sadistic people you'll ever meet work in the nuclear industry. And some of the laziest. And you know what they do with them? They make them managers. And when somebody like me comes along, they will try to make my life a living hell. But I found out that I have the, the skills and the abilities to make their life a living hell. Over the years, I am told by people that would know that I caused 22 separate managers in TVA nuclear program to lose their jobs. And you know what? I don't feel bad about that. TVA holds the world's record for the most whistleblower cases filed over health and safety of any nuclear facility in this country. I personally seen to it. So therefore, I 
No, I've been successful in my travels along with TVA, running with them. And when they would do something to me, I would file. I would come back. I would, I would call the inspector general. I'd call the NRC inspector. This was before the days of Pete Domenici. But also what I did was I stood up to these bullies because they're nothing but a bunch of bullies. And once you, you turn around and go, boo, right back at them. One time they said, oh, and what you'd done was just really, really mean. And I said, oh, no. I said, they were in, trying to, just, they were just harassing me. And they said, well, but what they did was not nearly as bad as what you done. I said, listen to me. I've told you and I've told you. I'm not playing with them. They were playing with me. This is about my life and I'm not going to play. When you play with me, you know that you're going to play with a big girl. Because I don't take prisoners. And they know I don't. You want to play games? I'll teach you some games. Because I don't play games with them. I refuse to be a victim of their stupid games. I'm a survivor. I'm not a victim. This industry is dying on the vine. It's dying and they're in desperate straits to bring it back into the forefront of, of energy uh, production. We don't have, we don't have enough uh, uranium to sustain it in this country. We're going outside the country to buy the uranium. This was why they suddenly decided that they wanted to reprocess the fuel rods and make some new ones. But uh, that was something that I said earlier, and let me get back to that right quick. The reprocessing of the rods, every nuclear power facility has to have, it's like a um, special made shoe. The fuel that goes into these reactors has to be specially made for that particular reactor. They have to have or the same design. They have to have a specific number of pellets, and, uh, uh, the exact amount of uranium. Everything has to be exact or there's problems with the reactors. And there's problems already showing in some of these reactors where the fuel rods and the, where the, the mix is not, it's not right and it's causing problems. Now they won't admit to this, but I have inside information. And I am told that these, where they want to take these nuclear weapons materials from Russia and from all these places and bring it in here to make fuel. They don't know what they're getting. It might be medical waste, it might be nuclear fuel waste, it might be uranium waste. They don't know what they're getting. And just mixing it all up together, that's toxic nuclear soup. So when, Fukushima when you're Daishi talking about a place city, like Fukushima, I mean, the first thing they did okay. was put the emergency diesel generators basically underwater when they built the wall. Babcock and Wilcox have been in enough nuclear plants, they knew that what they were doing was going to lead to a disaster because they were sitting on the coastline. The tsunamis, that, that's not something that we are used to in this country, but a tsunami in Japan is like they have one when the seasons change. That is not a shock to anybody. But Babcock and Wilcox should be charged and put in jail for what they did over putting those emergency diesel generators which would have helped to save that plant and putting it up there on the hill why, instead why of putting it down behind that. Money? It was just profit or what? why didn't they tell the... That was complete stupidity. That was absolutely that kind of nonsense. To put it down there where, the, where the, they even built a wall supposedly going to hold the water off of them. A tsunami's not going to stop at a damn block wall. That was crazy. Walking, they're just criminals walking around. If it, I call them, it's the nuclear mafia is what it is. There's nobody in charge. I'm in charge. You and I are more in charge of what happens and the rules and make things safe more than they are. And Babcock and Wilcox now, they want to build some more nukes. They want to build some more for TVA. And TVA still got that mess down at Browns Ferry down there in Alabama. They've got, that place is hot. When you walk up on the pad to go into the plant, it's hot. 
They birth. <laughs> this is a place that's birthed their cooling towers to the ground three separate times, and they're made out of wood. This is th this industry. Americans should be more concerned today about what's going to happen here because we're nearing the end of that prediction that the uh, NPO and the NRC made the prediction that within the next 20 years there would be a major disaster in America because our human errors in these plants is the greatest putting us at the greatest risk because people getting scared, pushing the wrong buttons. Human error was TMI. Human error was at Chernobyl. Human error, you can't call that anything else at uh, Fukushima Daiichi except human error. But yet, they want to build more nuclear plants. Obama wants to use our tax dollars to, to build more plants or insure these plants. I hope he doesn't let them go spend any counting on getting that money. Not after what's happened on Wall Street today. Not after these Republicans are taking away the money. They don't want to finance anything except their buddies on Wall Street and the insurance industry and the gas uh, companies, the, the Exxon, Shell, all those boys. I mean, come on. Annie up some money, boys, and you can have all the money you want. But there's not one single nuclear program in America that is making money. They will tell you they are. But those that tell you that they are, they are hiding the, the nuclear program behind their coal-fired plants and their other diversified holdings. Because the one thing that is keeping them from making any kind of profit is that there are no decommissioning funds and that's why they're in business today and that's why they got 20-year extensions. It's now, not about... And what is the cost of decommissioning? Can you decommission these plants? Well, we still believe in this oxymoron of cleanup. There's no such thing as cleaning it up. I mean, that's, that's just... that's word games. You wouldn't want to go sleep where they're going to clean it up, trust me. Um, so, I mean, the cost of decommissioning right now, we don't know the exact cost because the prices are raising every day. Today, we're looking at close to $10 billion just to put one unit online. That's what, that's what we're looking at in today's market. And now it's going to rise even more with, with this wonderful market that these Tea Partiers, that game they played. I mean, they won, but what did they win? You know, they, they, they won that battle, but what kind of war did they win? Boy, howdy. But the other thing is, on decommissioning is, the fuel rods, that plutonium's going to be hot for uh, a half-life of 250,000 years. We are murdering our futures. We're murdering our water. We're mur murdering our air. We're murdering the ground. My reactor makes commercial, uh, is, it's a commercial reactor, but they're making nuclear weapons material in it called tritium. It's the same thing that we're fighting the Iranians in North Korea and Pakistan and India over. But we're doing it there in my backyard. Most people don't even know this. They won't, they won't accept it. 300 to 750% above the so-called legal limit in the river there beside me where I was raised. And they say, well, we've got a plan to clean it up. You cannot taste, see, smell, or feel radioactive contamination or contact. You can't clean it out of the water. You can't clean it out of the air. You, can, you can't clean it out of the soil. The only thing you can do is move it around. And they think it's okay. So this water that is that is being contaminated ain't gonna never be clean all over the world and in this country all over these where these plants are ain't gonna never be clean. And you can't run it through. You you can run it through rocks. You know this old adage: run it over seven rocks and it'll be clean again. Don't buy that. And 
Uh, don't buy that. And you're going to have hot rocks and hot water both. Yep, there is no emergency. There's no plan to, to save people, to save the planet, to save the people of this country. You would think no. if the people of this country are going to be contaminated, Even they're, going to be, they're going to be genetic diseases, cancers, all kinds of things for people in this country. These three commissioners, these three Republican commissioners that sits on the NRC commission, they should be ashamed of themselves. They should be run out, of, they should be tarred and feathered. For them to sit up there and say that we need more studies after this uh, uh, Fukushima disaster. They don't want to implement these safety issues. You know what? They should be, I mean, so, somebody should take them running because they're the, they're, it's the birth, king's birthday and they're not wearing any clothes. There's not even an evacuation plan in this country that will work to evacuate the people around 10 miles of this plant, much less the 50 miles, it, probably more like 100 miles that it's going to take that you won't even be able. Look at Chernobyl. Oh, that's different. It is not. A disaster is a disaster. Learned anything from Katrina? Look, look at the disasters that we're having with the weather right now. The Gulf of Mexico. Look at the BP mess. Americans do not learn until Americans stand up, grab the seat of their pants, and jerk them some backbone, and walk a, away from this kind of material disaster, they're, they're never going to know what hit them. To think in terms of a wall of water. Every one of these powerhouses uh, that is producing nuclear power sits on a ground fault in America. In fact, in a public meeting, and I've got the transcript, I specifically ask, was it a requirement that these plants be built on a ground fault? And the NRC said, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure. And I just looked at him and I said, you're not sure if it's a requirement or not? And he said, well, I'm not sure what you're asking. And I said, you're building on top of a potential earthquake. And every one of them has an, er, that ground fault underneath them. Is it a requirement that you build them on it? And he said, well, we build them where we can. And I said, well, that must be on top of a damn ground fault then, sir. Is that correct? And he said, well, I guess so, Miss Harris. What kind of people is in charge of building these things? I mean, <laughs> don't, don't we... We are the slowest learners in America. The average person in this country thinks that they get more radiation from the sun than they do from a nuclear plant. That's just a big fat lie. Every time the temperature of the reactor goes up or down, if they change the, if they bring it down uh, five degrees or 10%, whichever one you want to call it, if they raise, if they start moving it up, raising the production up, every time they do that, they have to dump radiation out into the air. See, people don't know that. They think they only get it when they're notified. Notified? You, let me tell you what. They can dump 50 times a day. They can dump every uh, 30 minutes. But they cannot, they can only dump a legal limit in one of those times. But whenever you add it all up, that's cumulative. So what are you getting? I believe you're getting a bit more at one whack because we all know that cumulative is much worse. I mean, that's just, cumulative means piling on. That's all that it is. Just piling on and piling on and piling on. And these, these guys are not going to tell you that. Most of, what I found out is most of the managers at these plants, they don't even know what that means. I go, what do you mean you don't know? I said, well, ma'am, I don't have an engineering degree. Okay, how did you get to where you are? Well, one guy said, I went to school. They had uh, this mock-up, and I went to school, and I passed the test. 
And I said, okay, and you made a hundred. And he said, no. He said, I got a hundred. I said, you passed it then. He said, well, I, I said, how many questions did you have? He said, well, I, I don't really want to talk about that. And I said, okay, let's say you had ten questions. And I said, how many of them did you get right? And he said, well, the ones that I answered, I got them all right. I said, did you answer all the questions? And he said, well, no, ma'am. And I said, well, then how did you get a hundred? And he said, well, you only get graded on those that you answer that are right. I said, what if you miss the questions on how to shut the control room down? Or which room, which door to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to leave it so that you can get in and out? Or which one, which one has the card key for it? Which one's got your palm on it? He said, well, ma'am, I didn't get that far. <laughs> and these are the managers. The, the, these are the unit operators. These are the unit operators, honey. They take these kids out of Iraq that's come home that are suffering from all the crap they've seen and been through, and they put them in charge of security around these plants. They treat these people like they're bondage slaves. The security guards, security guards are beginning to drop like flies in this country. Nobody's looking at them because they're dying. I mean, we had four out of one unit at TVA in the past five years. Four in one year died with brain tumors. You can't tell me that that is just from smoking or that's just from uh, walking around or they didn't eat right or they just had a heart attack. Cancer is not the only thing that happens out of radiation exposure. There's uh, miscarriages. There's men being impotent. There is uh, learning disabilities. There are heart problems. Diabetes is rampant in this industry. I can name you in alphabetical order five people that I know of in the past six months that have died just from the effects, side effects from diabetes that worked at nuclear plants. This is not, this is, this is as serious as the coal industry. Now the coal industry say, oh, nothing's worse than what you do to babies. But children are being born with birth defects. They're, this is before they ever come out of the womb. And the, the exposure to some of these chemicals that is, comes out of here, you're talking about strontium, talking about cesium, talking about um, tritium exposure is uh, the, the worst of the three isotopes. I mean, it is the nastiest that comes out of this industry.